Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Ron McKenzie Lafergie. The world can be a pretty scary place. While science continues to help us understand more and more about the universe, there are still many great mysteries out there. One such mystery is that of Cthulhu, the great power first described in Lovecraft's short story, The Call of Cthulhu. But what if this ancient being was not bound to the pages of books, but did in fact exist? How might the world change if this creature made itself known? Let's explore. Since Cthulhu isn't exactly well known by the everyman, I'll start off with a brief description of the mythos surrounding the creature. It should be noted that Lovecraft originally intended the name to be pronounced closer to Clulu because it originates in an alien language that can't be properly spoken by humans. However, the easier form, Cthulhu, is more prevalent, so that's what I'll be using in this video. Which is great because I haven't spoken alien since high school, so I'm a bit rusty. Cthulhu is believed to have been born on the planet Vorl in the 23rd nebula from Nug and Yeb, before traveling to Earth with his family and shape-shifting worshippers called the Star Spawn. Here, great wars were held between his group and other mythical races, eventually giving way to peace as they decided to share the Earth. Cthulhu later began hibernating in the sunken city of Rlit, where, according to legend, he remains to this day. However, legend speaks of cults that continue to worship the old god even while he lies dormant. Physically, Cthulhu was described by Lovecraft as, quote, a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and four feet, and long, narrow wings behind. It has been described as a hideous combination of a man, an octopus, and a dragon. Generally depicted as being hundreds of meters tall, Cthulhu was seemingly created with the intent of striking fear and disgust into the hearts of men. This proved to be highly relevant in the myths, as it's claimed that merely gazing upon Cthulhu would cause the viewer to go insane. The myths say that Cthulhu will eventually awaken from its slumber and will rise to once again take over the world. So let's imagine a world where this beast existed. How might it differ from the world we know? Well, if Cthulhu remained asleep, nothing much would change. Those who found the creature deep in the ocean would go insane and likely die before even telling others about the find. Even if they made it back to land, their stories wouldn't be believed, due both to the extraordinary claims and, more importantly, their lack of sanity. However, even a dormant Cthulhu certainly isn't impotent. According to legend, Cthulhu continues to influence the world in a few ways. For one, its telepathic abilities allow it to enter the minds of people around the world. Not only that, the followers of Cthulhu are believed to be constantly working to bring about the gods return, often engaging in human sacrifice. However, if Cthulhu were to be awoken, it would be a very different story altogether. If Cthulhu awoke and began roaming the earth, madness would sweep the globe. All who saw the beast would go insane, with the world quickly falling apart. Cthulhu would likely surface in the South Pacific, as that's where Rillet is believed to be. He would either travel east towards Chile or west towards New Zealand. When word spread of the mass insanity due to a giant elder god, countries around the world would do whatever possible to take it out, regardless of the collateral damage. New New Zealand, as horrific as it would be, would be far better than allowing the world to fall into madness. Unfortunately, humanity's attacks would likely be ineffective. In most depictions of Cthulhu, it's claimed that it would simply reform after destruction if hit with a nuclear bomb, much like it did in one story after being cut in half. Furthermore, it could be that the Earth would become overrun by the spawn of Cthulhu. It's believed by some that this alien race known for worshipping the Great One was created by Cthulhu himself, and upon awakening, he would once again bring them to life, to act as his foot soldiers and to lead the human slave. As if the hulking behemoth wasn't enough to deal with, now we'd have terrifying, shape-shifting creatures in the mix. This would make it essentially impossible for humanity to come out on top, or even find a place to hide. All this means that humanity would be more or less powerless to stop Cthulhu, who would take over the Earth, once again reclaiming it for itself and its worshippers. Those humans who survived might be allowed to keep their sanity in return for subservience, but the Earth and humanity as we know it would likely be gone forever. And now we return to our question, what if Cthulhu was real? Well, if it stayed asleep, at the bottom of the ocean, the world would be much the same, aside from the odd sacrifice and confusing dream. However, if it was awoken, there's a good chance that humanity would be done for. With little chance of harming the Great One, we would most likely either be destroyed, driven mad, or enslaved. So let's all cross our fingers and hope that this is, in fact, just a myth. Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Ron McKenzie Lafergie. Yes, it's time for yet another entry to our Cthulhu series, this time focusing on one of the most popular entities in the entire mythos, Nyarlathotep. Nyarlathotep, the crawling chaos, is the incredibly powerful, malign deity found in the Cthulhu mythos, who wanders the earth using a wide variety of masks or avatars. He was created by Lovecraft after he had one of the most horrible and realistic dreams of his life. But what if this was not a fictional creature inspired by the dreams of the disturbed Lovecraft, but actually existed? Let's explore. As with other videos in this series, this video will assume that Nyarlathotep is the only Lovecraftian entity that exists. For the purposes of this video, the other gods and old ones, as well as his minions, do not exist. 
Furthermore, as with many Lovecraftian horrors, the name of Nyarlathotep has a number of pronunciations. The most realistic one I found is this one by Lehman Kessler of Ask Lovecraft. The closest pronunciation I've been able to find is Nyarlathotep. However, I'll be saying the name a lot, and that's way too hard to say, so I'll just anglicize the hell out of it and say Nyarlathotep. That way it reflects some of the Egyptian origin of the name, since Hotep is an Egyptian word meaning to be at peace. With that out of the way, let's hop in. Nyarlathotep is quite different from other Lovecraftian horrors. While most beings in the mythos speak an ancient, incomprehensible language, Nyarlathotep is able to communicate in any human language. Also, following the Great War, most of Cthulhu's kind were exiled, with most elder gods exiled to the stars, like Yaxathoth, and many great old ones slumbering beneath the ground like Thulu or Yitogtha. Yarlathotep, on the other hand, is not trapped, and is best known for his propensity to walk the earth under a number of guises, and influence humanity in a number of ways. For example, when he emerged from Egypt, he was said to be a tall, swarthy man of the old native blood, looking like a pharaoh. This is how he is typically described, but it is far from the only way he has appeared. For example, when he appeared in China, he took on the appearance of a morbidly obese woman, with five mouths and many tentacles, referred to as the bloated woman. He has been seen as complicated machinery, referred to as the TikTok man, when engaging with technologically advanced civilizations. More recently, he took on the appearance of an African-American pimp in Los Angeles, going by the name Mr. Skin. This is to say that you really never know how Nyarlathotep will appear until it's too late. Nyarlathotep is often depicted as the messenger of the outer gods, acting as a servant of Azathoth, his father. In terms of actual power, Nyarlathotep is one of the most widely debated beings in the mythos. Some believe him to be second only to Azathoth, while others consider him a mere lackey. Sadly, the stories are vague enough that it's difficult to say for sure how powerful he is. However, he is highly gifted at gaining followers. He's able to force others to worship him, as was seen when the Fellahin, Egyptian peasants, knelt before him, even though they didn't know why they were doing it. He then went on to roam the earth, using magical devices to force unwilling humans to follow him. This was done with the help of amazing, seemingly magical instruments, as he drew people in with the spectacle. This was all inspired by a nightmare Lovecraft had, and many believe the character may have been partially based on Nikola Tesla, who used similar amazing instruments to baffle and transfix crowds. But what if this outer god was not spawned in a dream, but actually existed? Frankly, if we're describing a tall, thin man who's excellent with technology, great at drawing supporters, and quick to anger, a certain someone comes to mind. Of course, Elon Musk almost certainly is not an avatar for an outer god, but there is a good chance that Nyarlathotep would take on a similar form if he was to appear in the modern day. But what exactly would happen if this was the case? Well, that would depend on his goals. In the literature, he has acted in a wide variety of ways. Sometimes he seems intent on enslaving all humanity, sometimes he's simply acting as a messenger, and sometimes he actually helps us, with some reports claiming that he aided us in moving forward technologically. Since this video will assume that there are no other outer gods for whom Nyarlathotep would be a messenger, let's focus on his other aims. Unfortunately, if Nyarlathotep wished to enslave humanity, it's likely that there wouldn't really be much we could do about it. Based on the literature, Nyarlathotep seems to be pretty unstoppable. Not only does he possess immense power, but he is also believed to be highly intelligent and cunning. It's likely that any attempt to stop him would be for naught, and humanity would likely be enslaved and forced to worship him. As was seen in the prose poem Nyarlathotep by H.P. Lovecraft, his unwilling followers would be unable to resist the call of the outer god. Even the most headstrong and stubborn would stand no chance against the irresistible will of the entity. Of course, it would take time for him to take control of everyone on Earth, but with his immense power combined with his ability to change his form, it would be just about impossible to stop him. When reports of a man wandering the Earth enslaving humans were confirmed, it's possible that people would turn to suicide in order to avoid becoming a slave. Many would, of course, try to hide away and avoid the outer god, but most people would either end up dead or enslaved. Nyarlathotep would become the new god of the world, although he would be better seen as a devil. He would force us to work for him and reshape the world as he deems fit. He might even subject humanity to gruesome experiments, both in the pursuit of knowledge and to bask in our suffering. Certain humans might gain his favor and become empowered, perhaps even becoming his four horsemen, but for the majority of humanity this would likely go badly. However, it's possible that being led by Nyarlathotep would not be the worst thing in the world. If he was happy at the top, it's possible that he would use humans to create an amazing world of technology. Sadly, we might not actually be able to enjoy it since his slaves tend to go rather mad, but if he eventually released his grasp on the human race, we might be able to enjoy a world of technology and wonder, and might even venture off into space. Perhaps we would come to accept him as our god and will become willing followers, allowing us to retain our sentience while working to serve his goals. On the other hand, it's possible that he would not wish to be the great leader of Earth, but would prefer to send it into ruins. In this case, he might manipulate things such 
established that two factions of humans were created, both worshipping a different avatar. He would make it so that we destroyed each other using all weaponry available, including nuclear weapons, as he watched in glee. Given his love of madness and death, this would be the best of both worlds for Nyarlathotep. And now we return to our question, what if Nyarlathotep was real? Well, without other gods to serve, he would likely try to take the helm by himself. He would wander the earth, enslaving the human race with the help of his magical instruments, bringing us all under his control. Some might die in struggles or to avoid becoming a mindless slave, but most would likely fall prey to his enchanting ways. This could be the end of humanity, but it could also lead us to great technological progress, and eventually we might even come to accept Nyarlathotep as our leader, thanks to some strange eldritch Stockholm Syndrome. On the other hand, he may realize that leading us is just not his bag, and might use his great influence to cause humanity to destroy itself. Although, frankly, the way things are looking politically, that might not be a huge change to our trajectory. Hello internet and welcome back to the most inquisitive channel on YouTube, life's biggest questions. That cosmic place between reality and endless sleep, where we worship our one true queen, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young. Come on guys, she's great, really. What's going on question is, as always, I'll be your host Jack Finch as we pledge our eternal servitude to the great old ones and outer gods alike and nonchalantly ask the question, what if Shub Niggurath was real? To paint ourselves a picture of a world where Shub Niggurath is warmly smiled upon more so than the Queen of England herself. Before you do that though, you know how it goes guys. If you're a fan of this video, HP Lovecraft, or the worship of abyssal cosmic entities, then go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with our latest and greatest uploads. Also, why don't you go ahead and share it with a friend or potential Cthulhu cultist so you can disseminate the spread of Eldritch influence in a much more efficient manner. Now, it's no deep mystery that the works of HP Lovecraft have inspired an entire school of thought in horror. The idea of a great, twisted, writhing beast of such immense grotesqueness and infinite cosmic power that the human mind can't even begin to comprehend their inner workings and are thus driven to complete and utter madness. Still though, that has hasn't stopped hordes of fictional zealots making it their life's work to usher in the reign of Great Old One and Outer God alike. None of these are more beloved than Shub Niggurath herself, like a weird, twisted, ginormous Taylor Swift capturing the hearts and minds of bright young budding cultists the entire universe over. Really, she's great, don't judge a book by its cover. Shub let's call her Shub, it's got a ring to it, first appeared in 1928's The Last Test, a short story that was published in the Weird Tales anthology series. Since that first appearance, her legend had grown like a mighty meaty seed and sprawled its tentacles across all facets of the Lovecraft mythos, being picked up by more recent authors such as August Dereleth, Lynn Carter and Brian Lumley. In all seriousness, they can't get enough of our cosmic queen in waiting. Shub Niggurath is an outer god that also goes by the name The Black Goat of the Woods with a thousand young. She is a perverse fertility deity said to appear as an evil cloud-like entity. She's an enormous mass extruding black fleshy tentacles, slime dripping mouths and short writhing goat legs. As a bonus, small creatures are continually spat forth from her maw which are either consumed into the miasmatic form or escape to be some offshoot monstrous life form elsewhere in the universe. Out of all of the Lovecraftian deities, Shub Niggurath is undoubtedly the most extensively worshipped. Her hit list includes the high Hyperboreans, the Movians, the Tyog of Kana, that's got a ring to it, the people of the planet Sarnath, and an uncountable number of primitive druidic and barbaric cults across the cosmos, including Earth. She's so beloved that even non humanoid life forms worship her the Migo, a fungal based species, and the Nug Soth, an insectoid, almost reptilian race. What's great about Shub is that she's so accessible and doesn't discriminate on who or what can possibly meet the parameters for her love. She's all ears. Literally. Shub Niggurath can be summoned to any woodland at the time of the new moon, and it's a pretty straightforward utilitarian procedure. She wants to be ushered in and welcomed to the world like a bright, beautiful, blossoming, writhing mass. Yeah, you, you get the picture, but what if she was real right now, right here in 2018? We as humans systematically hang our shared adoration on pretty much anything and anyone. Charles Manson had more than his fair share of misguided cult of personality. People worship the Kardashians, the Paul brothers, even mumble rappers. So why not add a colossal brood mother to that celebrity list? How there are many more benefits than just a lousy maverick t-shirt if you dedicate your life's worship to the black goat of the woods with a thousand 
young and you won't even have to pay for it. Take Immortal Life as an example. In The Moon Lens, a short story written by Ramsey Campbell in 1964, we're given insight into a particular ritual of the Gothen Hubdak, Shub Niggurath, a cult of her favourite once human worshippers. When the deity deems a cultist more than worthy, a special ceremony is held in which the black goat of the woods ingests the initiate through her womb and then rebirths the cultist as a weird, transformed, satyr like being. And guess what? They're immortal too. How generous is that, right? Why would you want a new pair of Yeezys when you could be modeling immortality and a brand new pair of hooves instead? All of that could be yours for the small price of eternal servitude and your new relocation to a woodland area alongside like minded people. You'll get to wear some pretty awesome purple robes while potentially preparing yourself to be the next human sacrifice for Shub Niggurath's love. You'll get to stand amongst her dark, young, horrifying, pitch black monstrosities made of ropey tentacles that are twice as tall as a tree and stink like an open grave. If you're really, really lucky, then you'd even be able to drink Shub Niggurath's milk. Yes, you heard that correctly, her milk. If Shub Niggurath was real, then her unrelenting cosmic love would be felt all across the cosmos and we'd all happily fall under her warm eldritch embrace. Hold on a minute. I can almost feel it. Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Ron Mackenzie Lafergi. Today is time for the next stop on our seemingly endless journey into the disturbing mythos of Lovecraft. We've talked about Nyagtha, we've talked about Yogg-Sothoth, and now it's time to talk about the creature whose name seems to be a combination of the two, Ithogtha. Yeah, these videos give my tongue a workout. Ithogtha is the second son of Cthulhu who was imprisoned in the abyss of Ye by the Elder Gods. Now, as with our other Cthulhu videos, this video will assume that Ithogtha is the only Elder God or Great Old One around, so he won't have any competition on that front. However, since he is rather dependent on his servants, we'll assume that his servants are also real. This means that the Yugs, as well as their lord Ub, the father of worms, would also exist. Exist. Yes, the names sound disgusting, and yes, they live up to their names. More on them in a moment, but for now, let's talk about Ithogtha himself. Ithogtha first appeared in the Zothic Legend Cycle series, written by Lynn Carter. He looks something like a giant humanoid frog, with a single eye in the middle of his forehead, but he is much more disgusting and far, far larger. How large? Well, when a sorcerous priest tried to free him, he mistook his fingertips for mountainous heads, so he's pretty darn big. As with other beasts from the mythos, he has a number of tentacles on him, forming a sort of mane around his head. In terms of abilities, there's little we can know from the literature. Since he was imprisoned in the Abyss of Ye, he really doesn't get a chance to strut his stuff. However, we know a bit more about the abilities of his minions. These minions were the Yugs, large flatworm-like creatures found underground, also known as the Worms of the Earth. They're able to interact with humans and even transmit genetic information to them through organic darts. Although, frankly, I'm not entirely sure what that means. They're known to communicate with humans, offering them great wealth in exchange for cooperation as well as sacrifices. They're led by the large, slug-like creature known as Ub, the the father of worms, from whom the Yugs are spawned. In the mythos, they work to free their masters from their prison. So what might happen if Thithaktha was real? Well, that would depend on whether or not he was imprisoned. If he was free, things would look rather like they did with Cthulhu. He would be incredibly dangerous and would likely take over the earth. So for the purposes of this video, we'll assume that Thithaktha is still trapped under the earth and must depend on the Yugs to spread his influence on earth. How might this affect us? Well, first of all, it might take some time to convince the general population of the existence of the Yugs. The idea sounds pretty far-fetched, and most would shrug it off as just another silly conspiracy theory. This would make it quite a bit easier for the Yugs to infiltrate society, and influence powerful people by helping them to achieve their goals. Eventually, however, there's a good chance that one would slip up and be captured, which would allow even the most skeptical to come to terms with the strange new creature. If we learned that there were giant worms that were bribing people with money in order to gain their service, people would become even more suspicious of the rich than they are now. And that's saying something. Currently, people on all sides of the political spectrum are engaging in numerous conspiracy theories about the rich and powerful, with many believing them to be a part of some greater harmful agenda. If we knew that some rich people got that way thanks to some freaky worms that were serving a giant tentacle monster, it would change the way we looked at rich folks. But even if we did learn about them and we knew that they intended to harm humanity, there are some who would still take advantage of their supposed generosity. As we've seen throughout history, some people are more than happy to sell out their fellow humans in exchange for personal wealth and power. There's a good chance that the Yugs would prioritize powerful leaders with cult followings in order to influence as many people as possible. If they were around nowadays, they would almost certainly
certainly try to tempt Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin or even the British royal family in hopes of using their following to gain influence and perhaps release Ithogtha from his prison. And whether out of narcissism or greed, there is a chance that they would accept. In order to limit the actions of the Yugs and to stop people from being potentially corrupted, we might attempt to build devices that could locate and exterminate them. Since they tend to be found underground, these would likely be small drilling devices that could sense the movement or digging of the Yugs, find them, and kill them. We might also find ways to detect them when they're about in the world, looking for people to influence. This could be either with technology or simply training dogs to sniff them out. However, it might just be best to try to cut off the head of the snake. If possible, there's a good chance we'd try to hunt down Ub to stop more Yugs from being created and perhaps disrupt their structure. Without Ub, it's possible that the Yugs would become disorganized and might be easier to deal with, allowing us to exterminate them and move on with our lives. Otherwise, there's a chance that they would succeed, Ithongtha would rise, and humanity would be in for a bad time. And now we return to our question, what if Ithongtha was real? Well, his Yugs would cause quite the problem. Under the leadership of Ub, the Yugs would infiltrate world governments by promising money and power in return for allegiance. If they succeeded and Ithongtha returned, the world would probably be more or less doomed. If, however, we manage to stop them, either by hunting the Yugs down or killing their leader, then the world could begin to return to normal. Or at least as normal as it can be with the thought of giant conniving flatworms floating around in our minds. Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Ron Mackenzie Lafergie. It's time for yet another entry into our series on the Cthulhu Mythos, this time looking at the brother of Cthulhu, Thanid. This leader of the Elder Gods is one of the few peaceful creatures in the Mythos, said to be as good as his brother is evil. But what if this great benevolent beast was not just a creation of fiction, but actually existed in in real life. While Kthanid does have a place in the Cthulhu mythos, he was not actually a creation of H.P. Lovecraft himself. He was invented by Brian Lumley, an English writer of horror fiction. He wrote about Kthanid in his novel The Transition of Titus Crow. In this story, Titus Crow is killed but slowly brought back to life by a robot who recreates him cell by cell as a cyborg. Crow is later called upon by Kthanid and becomes the great being's champion in the battle against the great old ones. Kthanid looks exactly like his brother Cthulhu in just about every way. The same vaguely anthropoid outline, the same awkward octopus head, the same mass of tentacles, the same claws and narrow wings protruding from behind. The only physical difference between them is that while Cthulhu looks fully evil, Kthanid has golden eyes that radiate peace. To be fair, he still looks absolutely terrifying, but those eyes though. In terms of abilities, Kthanid is absurdly powerful, just like his brother. Whether through magic or, as Titus Crow speculated, through amazing technology, his powers are vast and seemingly endless. Certain abilities have been described, however. For one, he's capable of great thought. I don't mean the kind of great thought you need to have in order to understand Rick and Morty. This refers to Kthanid's ability to project his consciousness anywhere in the cosmos, and to communicate with beings across the universe. He also has the power of prescience. With the help of his viewing model, he's able to predict how any action might affect the future, giving him a limited kind of omniscience. Awesome, now we have a handle on Cthanid, so how much would his existence affect us? Well, for the most part, it wouldn't. Since the other great old ones and elder gods wouldn't exist, he likely would have no reason to come in contact with us here on Earth, and would simply allow events to unfold naturally. However, it seems that Cthanid cares a great deal about the universe and wants to keep it safe, as well as free. This seems to be one reason for his battle against the great old ones. This means that even if the great old ones didn't exist, there's a chance that Kthanid would still involve himself in the affairs of the universe. In most cases, Kthanid wouldn't need help. With his prescience, he could predict when a civilization would attempt to take over and put a stop to them before they gained power. It's even possible that he could use his great thought to show them the error in their ways without violence. However, just because Kthanid is incredibly powerful, that doesn't mean he's omnipotent. In the Titus Crow series, Kthanid sent Crow to Earth's dreamland. Kthanid sent Crow to Earth's dreamland since Kthanid himself was unable to go there. In this way, there could be limits to his power, and he might need to depend on others to help him to defeat the invaders. Perhaps they had avoided his detection or had somehow prevented him from becoming directly involved. It's even possible that they possessed certain flaws that could only be exploited by a human. Now, it is of course very unlikely that even if he did exist, and even if a civilization attempted to take over the universe, we would never hear about this. The universe is large and old, and it's highly unlikely that humanity would be capable of dealing with such a threat. However, since this would be a bit of a boring video if I just said nothing would happen, let's have a look at how things might go if we were involved in Cthanid's battle with the universal threat. If this was the case and humanity got involved, it's likely that we would need a bunch of help. If a civilization had the technology to threaten the safety of the universe, our technology would look 
absolutely primitive next to theirs. For this reason, Cthanid would likely need to empower us to help us win. This could either be by granting humanity special powers, or else providing us with technology that could rival that of the invaders. And if you're picturing the Power Rangers right now, I like your style. Ideally, we would win the war and earn the favor of Cthanid. In this case, it's possible, even likely, that humanity would begin to worship him as a god. Which makes sense, because, well, he is. Based on the literature, it's unclear whether or not Cthanid desires followers, but if we had helped him to save the universe, there's a pretty good chance that he'd have our backs. And having a real powerful god on our side who is willing to help us directly would be pretty useful. He could launch our technology thousands of years into the future, allowing humanity to suddenly travel through the stars. We could make use of technologies we couldn't even imagine with infinite resources and everlasting life. The possibilities are so vast that I couldn't possibly list them all here, but it would be a pretty great time to be a human. And now we return to our question. What if Cthanid was real? Well, there's a very good chance that nothing would change. Cthanid seems perfectly content to allow the universe to unfold naturally, as long as nothing threatens the balance. However, if something threatened the safety and freedom of the universe, there's a chance that Cthanid would step in. And in the unlikely case that he was unable to solve the problem, there's an even smaller chance that he would ask us to help him out, like he did Titus Crow. And if we helped him save the universe, it could usher in the greatest era of prosperity humanity has ever known, with the help of Big Daddy Cthanid. Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Rami. Mackenzie Lafergi. We're continuing our journey through the Cthulhu mythos, and today we'll be looking at Cthulhu's firstborn, Catanathoa. This great old one is usually nestled safely within the pages of Lovecraft's fiction, but what if it wasn't? What if it actually existed? Let's explore. If you want more what-if videos, check out our biggest what-ifs playlist on the channel. Now get ready, it's time to ask the question, what if Gatanathoa was real? That should be no surprise by now, we'll start with a description of Gatanathoa, since rather few people know much about it. Most haven't even heard of it. Gatanathoa originates in Lovecraft's Out of the Eons, but its story has been expanded upon by other authors. The old one is said to reside beneath Mount Yadith Go, in the continent of Mu, which is said to have sunk to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Stories say that it was brought to Earth from the planet Yagoth by a group of aliens who sealed it inside the mountain to to prevent it from wiping humans off the face of the Earth. Catanathoa is described as an amorphous monstrosity, and like Cthulhu, it has significant effects on anyone that gazes upon it due to its disturbing appearance. If you look at Catanathoa, your body is petrified, turned into a living mummy. This effect is often said to occur even if a person simply looks at a perfect replica of the old one. Petrification is a horrible process. Your body becomes leathery and you lose the ability to move, but your brain and other organs continue to function, keeping you trapped in a terrifying prison of your own body. The only way to escape this torture is to destroy the the brain, something that can take an awfully long time if there's nobody to finish you off. Needless to say, this would be enough to drive even the most mindful person insane after a while, so in a way, the result is the same as with Cthulhu. If the beast arose and began to petrify people across the world, we would of course need to try to defeat it. Thankfully, the beast has been challenged several times over the years in various mediums, so we can look to them to see how we'd fare. This will help us to determine how durable the god is, how much help it has, and whether or not we would be able to destroy it. Friedrich von Jung's Grimoire, Unausprechlichen Kulten, or Nameless cults told of how Tiog, the high priest of Shub Nigurath, tried to defeat the beast. Tiog attempted to use a special scroll to make him immune to petrification so he could look at Gatanathoa, but the old one's priest replaced the scroll with a fake one and Tiog failed. One somewhat more ridiculous but more successful attempt at defeating the beast comes from the Japanese tokusatsu show Ultraman Tiga. In the final episode, the hero Daigo comes up against a version of Gatanathoa called Gatanathor. Even in Ultraman Tiga form, Daigo stands no chance against the beast and is defeated. However, he's revived as Glitter Tiga, thanks to the light of humanity, and he manages to defeat Gatanathor with the last of his power. So based on these battles, as well as some that I don't have time to discuss, it seems that we could potentially defeat Gatanathor if we found a way to kill it without actually looking at it, and had a weapon as powerful as Tiga's color timer attacks. While it's unclear just how powerful these attacks are, if we look at their effects on monsters and the environment, it seems fair to assume that a nuclear bomb would be enough to kill it. This means that if the beast awoke and rose to the surface, we would likely need to resort to nuclear weapons. Not only would the power would be necessary, but the long range would allow people to fire at the beast without looking at it. Of course, this would result in collateral damage, but killing a relatively small number of people quickly is certainly preferable to dooming all of humanity to endless mummified lives. However, given the involvement of Gatanathoa's priests in Von Yun's story, it seems likely that these cultists would be working to hinder humanity's efforts. So not only would we need to worry about the old god that we can't even look at, we'd have to worry about the actions of its shadowy followers. It's possible that these people would have installed themselves into positions of power in order to prevent humanity from fighting back. They would attempt to foil our plans just as they foiled the plans of Tiog. One important point to clarify is that the petrification seems to work even with perfect images of the beast. This means that we wouldn't be able to use cameras or mirrors to get around it like we could with Medusa. Anyone who so much as glanced at a photo or video of Gatanathoa would be rendered useless. This means that much of the Earth may have seen an image of the beast before learning of the dangers
soldiers and would thus be stuck in a petrified hell. This would be especially harmful if members of government and military fell prey to this petrification since it would be more difficult to organize a nuclear strike. Now you might think, well that's not too bad because anyone who tried to take a photo of it would be petrified so they couldn't share it. Well the problem is there's a good chance that Gatanathoa's priests would attempt to circulate images in hopes of petrifying humanity before they had a chance to fight back. This would make it much more difficult to defend against the old one and could lead to humanity's defeat. In which case the lucky ones would die and the unlucky ones would be trapped in their fully conscious but completely immobile bodies. Yikes. And now we return to our question, what if Gatanathoa was real? Well based on past battles it seems possible that nuclear weapons would work on the beast. The problem is it would be difficult to coordinate without looking at an image of it, particularly with its priests attempting to derail humanity's defense. If we managed to get a solid nuclear attack off on the beast we might be able to kill it, despite the collateral damage. But if we took too long there might not be enough non-petrified people around to do the job. That is, unless we had a giant superhero who could use his color timer to defeat it, which, well, we don't. Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'm Ron Mackenzie Lafergie. Azathoth is the blind idiot god from Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. Veiled in mystery, it's said that its long slumber allows our universe to keep on keeping on. But what if Azathoth was real? How would this affect our world as we know it? Let's explore. If you missed our video, What If Cthulhu Was Real? Check it out next. But first, get ready, it's time to ask the question, what if Azathoth was real? Azathoth is Lovecraft's version of the creator god, similar to the Abrahamic god found in the Bible or the Quran. The being is described in 19. 31's The Whisperer in Darkness as the monstrous nuclear chaos beyond angled space. It should be noted that in this case it's believed nuclear referred not to nuclear energy but rather to the nucleus of the cosmos. This is because nuclear energy was not an idea that would have been known to Lovecraft at the time. In terms of its appearance there wasn't a huge amount of information given in the mythos. This is largely because Azathoth wouldn't be understood by mortal beings since it's said to occupy a position outside of the universe. It is said that Azathoth remains in an eternal slumber like Cthulhu However, when it awakes, Azathoth wouldn't start taking over worlds or driving people insane like Cthulhu, our universe would cease to exist, since we exist within its dreams. Of course, if Azathoth remained asleep, it's likely that the universe would be largely unaffected. The mythos describes Azathoth as being completely uninvolved in the way the universe functions. Not only does it not care about the many planets and creatures living within its dreams, it is completely unaware of their existence. This was part of the reason it's called the Blind Idiot God. However, some believe that even though Azathoth is unaware of our existence, and doesn't consciously manipulate the universe, he can still influence it greatly. Many accounts hold that as Azathoth shifts and moves in its sleep, whole galaxies can be wiped out and laws of physics can be turned on their heads. If the stability of the universe depended on the subconscious thoughts and movements of this god, it could be that the universe would be a very unpredictable place, even if the great god remained asleep. However, if Azathoth awoke, many believe that our universe as we know it would blink out of existence, no longer being sustained by the dreams of this great god. Some have related this to the story behind the Red King in Lewis Carol's Through the Looking Glass, who was believed by some to be the true dreamer in the story, rather than Alice. This idea of depending on the creator to remain asleep might sound rather terrifying at first, but when you think about it, this isn't particularly difficult from some understandings of the universe. If we look just at the Earth, we know that the Earth will eventually be engulfed by the Sun as it goes supernova. That's assuming we haven't destroyed it ourselves by then. Some even believe it likely that our universe will eventually blink out of existence, whether it's through the ending of a simulation or a return back to a singularity. However, the fact that Azathoth could wake up at any time makes this particular story even more troubling. It should be noted that while this is probably the most widely accepted theory as to what exactly Azathoth is, there are alternate interpretations of the god. Lovecraft was, after all, extremely vague in describing it. Some believe it to be a giant beast residing at the center of the universe as the king of gods. This is more comparable to a Greek or Roman pantheon, roughly equating Azathoth to Zeus or Jupiter, rather than the god of the Bible. Still others believe that by claiming that the Cthulhu mythos exists within the dreams of Azathoth, that it was actually the reader who was Azathoth. By reading and thinking and dreaming about the world created by Lovecraft, we bring it to life in a way. By this definition, Azathoth does exist, since we humans exist, at least as far as we know. And now we return to our question, what if Azathoth was real? Well, if he remained asleep, there may not be a huge amount of change, since by some accounts it would be uninvolved in our universe. However, it's possible that interruptions in the dream or movements in its sleep could cause significant and unpredictable changes throughout the universe. And if it awoke, it would be so long and thanks for all the fish. Our universe would be gone and Azathoth would have the longest, most satisfying pee ever after such a long sleep.